ask you to join me in prayer. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, a rock and a redeemer. May we be able to hear your voice so that we might be able to share your words. May we be open to realize how much sometimes our tongue controls our relationships and at times destroys our relationships. May this morning your Holy Spirit allow us to hear you and speak your words. In Christ's name we all pray. Amen. Um, I have to say, you know, becoming a father later in life um, has entirely changed any perspective or idea of what life should be or could be. And I can tell you that I feel that in the past two years, uh, I feel like I've been almost immersed in this college degree uh, class on how to be a good parent with no choice. Uh, and it feels like every day I'm going to school, learning something new, going to class. And sometimes I'm prepared and some other times I'm not prepared at all. And for example, the, the classes change from day to day, from moment to moment. So for example, the other day I went to a parenthood class um, on how to deal temper tantrums just as you are about to put your child in the car seat. That's a new class that I never thought I was going to need to take. Or the other class that I had to take was uh, creative diaper, diaper changing when you forgot the diaper bag. <laughs> what do you do in that moment? Or the latest class that I've been on an intense, an intense daily routine now is uh, the class is called 45 minutes of straight singing the same song as the bed routine changes every day, every night. Does that sound familiar to any of you who, who have had children or the teachers? Maybe you have to go to the same routine with your students. But anyway, I think that, uh, to say the least, it's been a, it's been a learning experience. But as I'm, I'm immersing in that college degree on parenthood, I, um, I also been learning songs and rhymes that I need to sing to Eli. Now, you have to remember, I did not grow up in this country, so learning all those rhymes and songs is really a new experience for me entirely. So as I've been doing my research, um, I come across a lot of beautiful rhymes and songs, but I came across um, this rhyme that was interesting to say the least. Uh, the name of it is Sticks and Stones. Do you know that? It goes something like this. Um, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me or break me. Does that sound familiar? That's according to Wikipedia, so I don't know if I'm getting the right ones. I sometimes I have to get on Wikipedia to confirm what I'm doing. So now here's my issue with that rhyme. I'm not gonna teach it to Eli, I think, number one. But secondly, I don't know that I agree with the premise of that rhyme because in my personal experience, words do hurt you. And sometimes words do break you. So I don't know that that's going to be part of the repertoire that I'm going to have to learn and sing to Eli, because I don't agree with it. Now, as it has been said already this morning through our children's message and the scripture, words are very powerful. Words are powerful enough to encourage and sustain someone who is on the brink of destruction or depression. Words are powerful enough to help someone who is confused and lost to find a better life. Words are capable to uplift a life to new heights, to become someone else entirely, to reach out to things that they thought never, could never be possible. Words can be so powerful in a good way that they can make a life better. But words can also be destructive. They can be destructive to destroy relationships. Words can be powerful enough to destroy and break and hurt and uh, discourage and crush someone. 
Words are powerful enough to begin a war, to incite violence, to create a, a, an atmosphere or of evil and competition and big biting and all those things. Words can be powerful enough to destroy each other. Now, when it comes to our Christian faith, it is very clear that we have that same understanding of how words can be so powerful in a good way or in a bad way. Both the beginnings of the book of Genesis and the book of John began by telling us that God created everything into being by God's word. In fact, the book of John tells us that Jesus is the incarnation of God's word spoken. In other words, the word of God so that we could understand that became Jesus in real life. So that we might be able to see that the words of God are not just words, but actions that bring peace and love and compassion to all of us. Words are critical and important to all of us because through those words, we can either create like God created or we can destroy and hurt and crush others. The book of James, as you heard this morning, shares with us that our words have positive or negative consequences in this world. And not only that, but James reminds us that it's so easy to use our words to bring negativity and pain and hurt into this world. So easy that we don't even realize that we're doing it sometimes. So easy that James describes the tongue almost as an organ with a mind of itself. A, a tongue, the tongue is that something that so it just starts and it's really hard to stop. And so this morning, James comes to us to remind us not only that we're capable of praising God with our tongues, but we're also capable of cursing God and others. That we need to be careful with the words that we use because at the same time, we can pray and praise God, but at the same time, we can curse and move farther and farther away from God. The book of James shares with us this morning that there are consequences to our words and we need to watch them carefully. Now, here's what I notice when I go to the doctor. Every time that I go to see the doctor with some sort of an infection, there are two things that I know are gonna happen. One, she is going to ask me to open my mouth so she can check my throat. And the other one is that she's gonna ask me to open my mouth so that she can, she can check my tongue. Because the doctor, by looking at my tongue, can begin to tell the story of what kind of infection I have. Depending on the color of my tongue, she can begin to guess what is it that is happening to my entire system. What's wrong with my system, what needs to be changed, how I can get better. And in a similar way this morning, James is, James is inviting us to look at our tongue this morning. Because by the words we speak, we can tell, God can tell what is wrong with our Christian faith. What is wrong with our system, what needs to change, what needs to be redirected, and how maybe we need to even just completely shut it. James began this tongue checking by warning first the leaders of the congregation. Now you have to remember, James is initially talking to the leaders of this Christian synagogue as they began to struggle and wrestle with the idea of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Now, in this congregation where James is speaking to, the leaders are not just the regular leaders of any congregation. Any leader selected in that congregation had the same weight and respect as a rabbi would have in a Jewish synagogue. In other words, the leaders of, the, of that congregation and that community were very important to the people who would listen to them. Not only because people would trust them that whatever they say was true, not only because they would trust that whatever advice and wisdom they were giving to the people, they were gonna also do it for their own lives, but the people would never Im imagine in their lives that someone who is a leader within the congregation would use the words to hurt other people or to manipulate people into doing certain things. 
James begins by telling the leaders of the congregation, if you're going to be a teacher, you better be careful with what you say. Now, here's the thing. This morning, James is not only speaking to the leaders of the church. James is speaking to all of us who profess to be Christians. Because willingly or unwillingly, you have become a teacher to others of what it means to be a Christian. It doesn't matter how new or how old you are in the faith, we all have become teachers of the faith. In fact, this morning as we just did this beautiful baptism, I don't know if you realize, but in the prayers that you said, in the words that you repeated, you made a promise to be a teacher to this beautiful baby of what it means to be a Christian because she doesn't know what's going on and the only thing she's gonna get to see as she grows up is your faith in action. So we are all teachers, which means again that we all need to be careful with the way we talk, the way we express ourselves. Here is, I think, um, the bottom line or the beginning of the bottom line of this advice that James has for all of us. Our tongue needs to be in check because if we don't, it can easily start a fire, an uncontrollable fire that will destroy your life and the lives of others. Biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann, um, paraphrasing him, he says about this scripture that James is choosing a very strong image of fire to make the point how fire, when it gets out of control, does not respect anyone or anything. Once the fire gets out of control, it's going to burn anything on its path. And what, what James is saying is, is reminding us that from the beginning of the Christian and the Hebrew faith, words have always been very important. And that tradition of being careful with our words continues to the Christian faith. The words that we speak create a new world that can be good, compassionate, abundant, good, joyful, but also the words that can, we speak can create a word of destruction, of hurt, and pa of pain, of violence, of humiliation. So God wants us from the beginning to be careful with the words that we use, not just for ourselves, but for the testimony and the world that God wants to create in this world. James uses the, the language of violence but maybe I also want to use the, 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 the language of words can be weapons of mass destruction. Words can be used to, again, entirely hurt and destroy others. One of the most destructive places in our common era that the people, the congregation in James's time didn't have to deal with has to do with our electronic communication. I do not have to tell you, even for those of you who avoid having a smartphone or being on Facebook or any of those sorts, I cannot tell you how much evil it is done with the words that we speak to each other on social media. May it be Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, help me here, please. That's good. Okay, I'm, I'm done. Okay. I, I think you get the point. Email. email, email, thank you, email. We have a problem with the way we use those platforms to insult each other, to hurt each other. And I don't think that I need to tell you that bullying, the bullying that takes place online not only hurts the feelings of young people and all people alike, but in some cases, the, the online bullying had led young people to take their lives. Now you may think, that's just for the young people. I'm not part of that. 
Well, you know, the other day, well, actually, like a, a few years ago, I went to a training for pastors. And they told us to be careful with the way we send emails to the people in our congregation. But they also told us, don't read emails after 5 p.m. Because otherwise, you might not get to sleep well. Because sometimes the emails that we get are really mean and hurtful. So it's better not to read it before you go to bed so that you can sleep well and be ready for the next day. We communicate in ways that we destroy each other, that we hurt each other. Now, I'm going to stop here for a moment before you start thinking that I'm trying to take away our right to express ourselves. I'm trying to take away our right to, to be right. Or I'm trying to take away uh, your right to express your opinion. I don't think that that's what I'm doing or what James is saying. But I think that what James is saying to us is that the moment our words, even if you're right, are mean and hurtful, vindictive, and that's you know, created to make hurt, hurt the other person, we have lost the battle. The moment you use your words, even if you're 100% right, and you express anger through those words, any good that you were trying to accomplish is completely gone. Because people are not going to listen to you. People are not going to be changed and transformed when there is anger and meanness in what you say, even when you are right. The prophet, the prophet Micah told us very clearly that we are to do justice. We are to do and make this world right. But we do it with kindness and compassion and humility. We don't do it with mean, meanness, vindictiveness, and yelling at other people, even if we think we are right. Here is the bottom line of the message of James to all of us. Have we stopped and wondered why our words can be so mean and angry and hurtful? Have we stopped? Have we stopped to, to think for a moment if even when we are upset or frustrated, frustrated with someone, have we thought if there is still kindness in what we're telling the other person? Is there kindness in our disagreements? Is there kindness in the way we talk about others? Or just simply anger that destroys and hurts? Now here's what I learned this week. <clears throat> Depending on, on the study that you read, they say that we speak between 10,000 and 30,000 words a day. Just think about it for a moment. That includes writing and all of the things that we do. Now, one of the studies said that uh, men speak 15,000 and women speak 30,000. Now, the reason, I asked Michelle, the reason why women use more words is because they have to repeat things to us because we don't listen. <laughs> That's what she told me. I'm just going to leave it there for all of us. 10,000 to 30,000 words a day. How can we use those 10,000 to 30,000 words to do good? Can we commit ourselves to use those 10 to 30,000 words to stop hateful speech, vindictive speech, angry speech? Can we commit ourselves to be the first ones to stop meanness? Can we commit ourselves when we hear of color jokes or gossip or inappropriate conversations about women personally or online to be the first ones to stop 10,000 to 30,000 words I want you to think about the amazing possibilities to do good with those words 
part of our Hebrew tradition is this understanding that just like God, when God speaks, God creates. When we speak, we create. When God speaks, God, God creates goodness. So in a similar way, God hopes that when we speak, we may create goodness. The good news is that James, although you may think that he's rough and to the point and a little bit angry, I think that James actually believes that we can use our words for good. The good news is that we can use those conversations to bring the light of Christ in the midst of us. The good news is that we can use those words to recreate the world that God intended from the beginning. Because James is reminding us something very important. As much as we may not want to accept this, but our words reflect our character. Our words reflect our character. And so God wants to change that character to reflect God's love. May our words reflect the character and love of Jesus. Not just on Sunday morning, but every single day of the week. May we together learn to speak with kindness. Amen.